You're listening to the Finding Career Zen Podcast. I'm your host, Pete Newsom, and I'm joined today by Clay Ostrom. Clay is a founder and brand strategist of Map and Fire and has been featured as a contributing writer to Founder Magazine and Adweek. And over the years, Clay's worked with brands including Go- Google, Sony, Universal Pictures, Mattel, Fox, DreamWorks, CBS, and many, many more. I could keep reading for a while, but that's not nearly as interesting as getting right to talking to you, Clay. So how are you today? I'm doing fantastic. I appreciate the intro. <laughs> awesome. Well, I could. It's a long list, man. You've, you've done a lot. You've done a lot over, <laughs> over the years. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things that you, you sort of forget sometimes until someone reads off a list like that. And then you're like, oh yeah, I guess I've been doing stuff for a while. That's, that's cool. <laughs> but you're, but you're, I, I, you're, but you're, you're, you're a young looking guy, man. So you haven't, um, you know, it's, it's worn, it's wearing well on you. Looks are deceiving. Yeah. <laughs> it's the California sun and, you know, and some, some meditation, you know, keeps me looking that way. <laughs> I, I was going to say from the first time we, we met, I you know, it was just really, um, I think we hit it off. Although our personalities are very, very different where I tend to be, you know, a little, um, a little intense maybe at times where, where, <laughs> you know, you're, you're just the guy that I want to be in terms of chillness. <laughs> I think that's even a war. <laughs> wow. Well, that's that's nice of you to say. I uh, I think some of that lack of chillness is kept bottled up inside, but on the outside, I try to keep it, you know, as as chill as possible. And you know, I, I, I like to laugh a lot too. That's a big part of how I like to engage with people. So hopefully, uh, hopefully, you felt that when we. Uh, <laughs> no, for for that. sure, without question. Um, but Clay, I, I mentioned that of course you're the founder of Map and Fire. But talk for a minute, if you would, about what Map and Fire does, who you guys are, and um, you know, and just whatever you want to share. Sure. Yeah. Um, so Map and Fire is a a brand strategy company agency, and you know we that's sort of the overarching umbrella that we talk about, and within that we we do sort of foundational brand strategy. We also do a lot of customer research. That's kind of a big part of how we try to think about how we're different and how we separate ourselves is that we're very focused on, on customer research, understanding who customers are, the psychology of them, and, and then basing the strategy that we develop around that, you know, so it's, I think a lot of agencies in the space are very creative driven, which is great. I think, you know, a lot of our work obviously relies on creativity, but we also want it to be grounded in as much as possible real data and really understanding, you know, who the market is um, and how they think about things. Because at the end of the day, a brand is a relationship between your business and a bunch of people <laughs> that you're trying to attract. And the better you understand them, the better you can kind of create that alignment. So that's why we focus on those things. When you talk to new companies, of which I was one when we first met, mm-hmm. um, I, I suspect the experience isn't completely different than it was with me, where you're um, leading you know, founders, you know, business leaders, whoever it might be at those organizations, down a path they've never gone down before. Is that is that pretty mm-hmm. common? Because that's certainly the experience I had when when we first met. It is. You know, I think everybody sort of has their own sets of experience with the space, you know, I think we do, we do deal with a lot of founders and owners who have never gone through a process like that before. Maybe they've thought about bits and pieces of it, but never done it in a really cohesive kind of more structured way. Um, We also deal with clients and customers who, who have been through variations of this before. And sometimes they've been through versions of it that you know, weren't super satisfying for them. And again, we can kind of come in and hopefully provide a different perspective, a different, a different approach that, you know, we're biased, I'm biased, but I think is a, is a very, we try to be very structured with it and also very transparent with the process so that people who haven't been through it before, you know, they understand how it works. You know, we're not just trying to create a black box and spit out answers. You know, we really want you to walk away with, a better understanding of how your business works and how the brand can grow. So, so when you're explaining branding to someone who's new to it, like I was, of course, I'm familiar with the concept and, uh, you know, from, a, uh, you know, from a distance, right. But I hadn't gone through those deep exercises, you know, soul searching, <laughs> if you will, um, that at times is 
challenging to to um, you know, to pull out. So when you're uh, you know, dealing with someone new in this, how, how do you sell the value of of branding? Yeah, it's a great question, you know, and again, I think that comes back to people's varying perceptions of what brand strategy even is, because I think sometimes it gets put in that, you know, a little bit more of a, maybe a warm and fuzzy bucket of, you know, oh, it's about, you know, maybe our mission and kind of our values and, um, you know, maybe it's a little bit about our look and feel of, you know, how the brand presents itself, but what I, you know, really try to get across with people is that it's much deeper than that. I mean, you know, I almost use interchangeably that this is really your business strategy as much as it is kind of your brand strategy. You know, we're talking about, again, fundamental stuff like your positioning in the marketplace. And, you know, that's understanding who your customers are, again, what motivates them, how you compare with the, the competition that's out there. And, the offerings that you put out in the world and how that satisfies your customers. So it's, it's not, it's not all warm and fuzzy. Like there are some, some high level ideas we talk about, you know, you know, we talked about, you know, core purpose and values and things like that. And those are a little higher level, but it doesn't end there. That's just, that's just a starting point. So it's, I spoke with a friend yesterday who's also a client and he's very much into leadership development. Um, it's, it's his passion and, and something he spends a lot of time thinking about. And he went through a program years ago, a formal structured program for, for leadership, and it was life-changing for him. And on the other side of it, he said that it, it was a way to get to know his authentic self. That, that was a phrase he used. And knowing I was going to talk uh, with you today, it reminded me of our journey uh, with Zengig, which is the, the brand name that you helped us come up with, um, <laughs> where it really got to the root of what, what we're trying to be, who, who, you know, who we are, who our audience is, and how we want to be viewed. And it was, um, it was impactful and, and, and deep. I keep saying deep because I, I, I don't, <laughs> I think most of the time we spend on the surface when it comes to business and a business name and mm -hmm. four corner resources the name of, of my staffing company. I certainly didn't um, go into deep thought with that. It was a matter of trying to find a, a domain that wasn't taken as mm -hmm. much as <laughs> which is part of it. That's part of it, <laughs> which is part of it. Um, so do you think that's a pretty good, uh, you know, to use that, that phrase of, you know, to find out who your authentic self is, you, you think that resonates? I think it does. I, you know, the, the very first thing we always tackle with this type of process is what's your backstory? How did you get to this point? And what drove you to get to this point to start a business? Because it's a big deal, you know, to go out to create a business and devote your so much time and energy into something like that. It's got to be driven from something internal, I think. A lot of times and that could be you've just got a deep level of expertise in a particular area or it could be a desire that you just want to be able to you know direct your own path your own career there's a lot of different things but it it often is a very personal journey that, that people go on so we at least try to um, recognize that and tap into that a little bit because it it does impact your perception of how you want to operate as a business and what your goals are. Um, you know, some, some people are out there to just, you know, they, sometimes they'll start from a place of, well, I started this just to make some money. But often once we peel the layers back a little bit, there's usually something else a little deeper, like you said, uh, behind that. Yeah, whether you realize it or not, probably, right? Because the, the depth yeah. is, is there. Um, it's whether you, how aware of it you are, per, perhaps. And yeah. I know you drew some stuff out with us that um, was always under the surface, but I don't think would have come out without you and, and the help of your team in that. Um, you know, when I, you know, thinking back to when I started Four Corner 17 years ago now, for the first couple of years, it doesn't happen as often anymore, but people would say, oh, I, I want to go start a business like that, right? And as, as a <laughs> business owner yourself, you, you know that it's not always um, roses, but I would say, great, doing what? 
and they'd say, I don't know. I just, I just want to be a business owner. I, I want to not have to work for the man or whatever it was. And, and I would say, that's not, that's not how I would recommend doing it. You know, it has to start with a premise, a belief, something that you have a, um, there's a purpose behind. And for me with Four Corner, the staffing company, I, I, I uh, talked about it for over a decade and thought about doing it and, and, and what ha- tell everyone you know, over the years, like, this is what I'm going to do eventually. And I don't even know if I meant it back you know, when I would say <laughs> it, but it was like the dream never died. And then it got to a point where how long can I keep talking about it without actually doing it? And mm-hmm. um, so to your point, I think every business has a story. It's, it's, it's about whether that story is able to come out. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the thing with, with that kind of stuff, with, understanding your purpose and your story and that why it's not just about helping you create a deeper connection with what you do but it's also about all the other people who are involved with what you do because every business maybe not every business there are certainly solo solopreneurs out there but you know if you're creating a team of any kind you are ultimately trying to rally people around certain ideas and of course everybody has to make a living and everybody, you know, needs paychecks and stuff, but especially with startups, it's so much work and you're asking people to do so many different things and contribute in different ways and maybe go above and beyond any kind of job description that they might have that you kind of need those extra pieces. You need some extra level of belief in what you're trying to create. I think that's what really motivates people at the end of the day to want to work on that versus you know, any of the other millions of things they could be doing with their time. You know, that brings up an interesting point. And I don't know that you'll have an answer to this, but I'm going to ask you anyway, put you on the spot that (laughs) for, for small businesses is so now, you know, starting Zen gig, we have a small team who went through this exercise with you and everyone's so enthusiastic about what we're doing. It's so exciting every day. We don't have enough hours and, no one's watching the clock and all, all these things that, you know, you would, um, I, I mean, I'm speaking for them. Maybe, maybe, they, maybe, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't, but that's certainly the impression that, that I get. And um, I'm thankful for that. But, and I, and then I think back to the early days of the staffing business and it's been a long time now, but I, I remember that us against the world feeling and every day was a fight for survival, David versus Goliath, whatever you want to call it. And it was real and it was meaningful. And we had that purpose without, going through having to talk about we felt it but as businesses grow so it's easy for me because you said startup right so i'm thinking of those times how does a business sustain that as you get farther away from that founding purpose the beginning you know once success has started to happen because i can tell you with with staffing company the the people who walked in at year 10 and saw lots of big names that we worked with saw progress and success and awards on the wall didn't feel like it was David versus Goliath anymore. And, and yeah. I've, I thought, I've often thought that, man, how do we get that feeling back? Do you have any thoughts on that? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's a really, that's an interesting point. And I think it is true. I think, you know, we talk a lot about company culture. What does that actually mean? And what does that mean day to day? You know, we, we talk about the importance of things like core values and what those represent and how they work sort of as your, your daily operating guide of how do we make decisions? How do we decide to do this thing versus this thing? Or, you know, when opportunities come up, do we take them or do we not? And all of those pieces, I think, feed into a growing culture over time. And it does take work, I think. It's not something kind of like you're saying, like you can lose some of that initial spark maybe over time, but what are the other things that you're still always building around? You're always, you know, every company, even if they're mature, is still trying to grow in different ways. And I I think it's always important to come back to, to, to consistently revisit what is the purpose? What is the thing that we're trying to accomplish? Because maybe we're not so much the David anymore. Maybe we're creeping more Goliathy over time, but 
we still have things to accomplish. We still have change that we're trying to make. We're still trying to impact the lives of our customers in a meaningful way. And I think it's just really important to always revisit, you know, what are, what do we all care about that's in common, you know, and it's, it is easy to lose sight of those things. It's easy to kind of just get sucked into the world of the bottom line, bringing in the business, you know, churning, keeping, keeping, keeping everything moving, keeping the machine going. And a lot of the clients that we work with, you know, we often work with people who have been in business for five, seven, 10 years, and they're now taking a moment to refresh on these things, or maybe even talk about them for the first time. So it's not, you know, it is, those things are always top of mind when you first start out, of course, because everything is fresh. But I think they're just as important to be revisiting and thinking more about as you get bigger, because your mission may have changed. Hopefully your values haven't changed. Those are the kinds of things we hope always stay consistent, regardless of how you grow and evolve. But other things about the business will change and the size of your team will change and all those things. So I think it's always interesting for us to have clients that come in who've been in business for 10 years and, you know, they kind of need that, that refresh, you know, that revitalization of what do we stand for? What do we do well? Why do we all care about the same things and, and that kind of stuff? It's important and it's hard to do. I, I as I've, as this is pure coincidence that happened last Thursday where I realized uh, that a lot of our new staff hasn't heard the story of my career and how Four Corner came to be, um, how I came to decide to start the company in the first place. And it's a very meaningful thing to me. It's very personal. It mm -hmm. is so representative of the business we are today and how we go about doing business. I mean, then, you know, the long and short of it is I had worked for two Fortune 500 companies. I became frustrated with just processes and procedures getting in the way of progress and constantly being you know, told no and, and teams of attorneys needed to change one word <laughs> on a contract. I mean, the whole deal, like the worst of a big company. And I thought there's got to be a better way. There has to be a way to do business in, in a personal way. And so that was my you know, primary founding principle for starting the staffing company. And that rings true today, but it it's not something we talk about and think about. And, and, and so half of our team has never even heard me tell that story. And, and I, I thought, what, <laughs> that's weird because to me, I've said it so many times that I think, you know, right. Pete, stop talking. Like no one, everyone's heard it enough, <laughs> like more than enough. Right. Um, but in reality, we've had people with us a year who've never heard it at all because we're virtual now. And because again, after 17 years, I don't feel the, the need to, to share that anymore. The sort of the evidence is there. It speaks for itself and the loyalty of our clients and the growth we've had. So do you have a recommendation if, if, because I think we could benefit from that. I think many companies could benefit from that who've been in business, but how do you pull in, you know, how do you, how do you have those conversations with a small group, but get the big group to benefit it because you can't stop progress, right? We spent a lot of time with you, uh, with, with, um, with Zengig. Is there a path to, to, to accomplish that for a bigger company or one that's been in business for some period of time? I think so. I think some of the bigger clients we've worked with, of course, we can't involve their entire team in the process, but we've had cases where we're working with fairly large leadership teams, sometimes as many as 10 or 15 people who represent the different, the different functions of the business in different capacities. And, you know, with any growing organization, those directors, those VPs have to represent the interests of <laughs> the people underneath them. Sure. And, so we'll have meetings with them to kind of talk about some of these ideas in the same way that we talked about with you, just on a slightly different scale. And then they have to dispense that information out to everybody. And I think that's another big part of what we try to do with this, right, is we're trying to not just talk about these things, but we're trying to capture it and get it down on paper in a way that can be shared. Because your point about the, the founding story of Four Corners 
is is perfect because of course everybody would love to hear it from you firsthand but as you grow and you bring a lot more people into the mix it's not realistic that everybody's going to get to sit down with you and get to hear that full story firsthand and that goes for other things too whether it's your core values or more functional things like your positioning and all these things so we need those things to be written down somewhere we need them to be documented so that it's being shared in a consistent way with everybody. Otherwise it becomes word of mouth. You know, someone else is telling Pete's story to the new hire and it kind of gets convoluted and a little mixed up and it's not exactly quite right. And, you know, you apply that to other aspects of the brand and the business and all of a sudden everybody's kind of, kind of going in the same direction, but maybe a little askew and working towards slightly different goals and, that's a recipe for a lot of wasted energy and time for sure. Yeah, but I think solving that is is can be a recipe for great success too. And I think the companies who uh, have been able to do that over the years that, that become really large, successful organizations find a way to bottle that and and share it without it having to come from one person because that's limiting. If mm-hmm. and and that's a realization that I had at some point that if. I'm, you know, as, as the, per, yeah, I started the business by myself and then we had two employees and three and for a business to sustain and grow, it can't funnel through one person. Yeah. You know, it can't be a hub and spoke deal. And so, you know, part of it was a conscious decision on my part to step away from trying to be in the middle of anything. You know, my happiest day that, that I've ever had in business was when from start to finish, we had a transaction go through that I didn't touch or, or was involved in in any way. And I thought we finally made it right now. Yeah. I don't necessarily think that anymore, but, um, <laughs> we, uh, uh, but on the other hand, to be ultimately successful, I think by any you know, rational standard, you, you have to have that buy-in and have that be what the organization's message is and not a person's message. And, mm. That I, I don't think we've gotten right yet with the staffing business as long, you know, even though we've been a successful organization, I think we'd be significantly more successful with that buy-in and that vibe that used to just be palpable in the office. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's almost hard to explain, you know, <laughs> maybe it was mm-hmm. a feeling of desperation that not knowing <laughs> how we were going to pay our bills from one day to the next, but it was meaningful and, yeah. and, and everyone who walked in the office felt it. And I just, you know, I really want to be able to capture some of that back because because it you you want you know, I want as an employer people who work for the organization to to buy in right, but you got to know what you're buying into, and 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 that's where hard work doesn't feel like work, right? You may put in hours and may you know have trials and tribulations. We know that's part of it, but if you feel like you're doing it for the right reasons, mm-hmm. then it, then it, then then you don't think of it as work, right? You just think of it as, as a mission. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really, that's, that's kind of what it's all about. And again, I think these younger generations, you know, not that we're so old, <laughs> these but, days. Got it. but, but the people <laughs> who are younger than us, I think those types of ideas are becoming just more and more important. I think people are making decisions again around where they want to work and who they want to work for, not strictly based on the best salary or or even the best benefits. Those things will always be important. They'll always be factors, but they also want to work somewhere that they feel like they're connected to a purpose or a mission or something that they is meaningful to them on a personal mm-hmm. level. And that stuff, again, it's, it's, I think more and more going to, I think that stuff is going to become the difference between who, you know, who's able to attract the best talent, you know, and I know that's an area you (laughs) have a lot of expertise in. And I think it's, it's, it's just a big differentiator. I think if you can walk into a place and they can sit down and tell you not just the nuts and bolts of what your day to day is going to be, but you know, what you're actually a part of and what that means. I think, you know, if you're kind of like picking between two different options, the one where you sort of feel like you could be part of something, whatever that happens to be, I think is going to be, you know, that may win out at the end. 
Yeah. So can you commit publicly right now to helping, uh, helping four corner get that feeling back? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. You hear, you heard it here first. Okay. We're, we're committed to, to helping with that. <laughs> I, think, I think that means I have to hire you to do it first. So that's part of it. Um, so we'll have that conversation later. Um, sure. So you, you spent enough time pulling things out of me when we first met, um, which you know, was, uh, was such a neat thing to go through. So I'll turn that around a little bit and ask, you know, how, how did you come to start Map and Fire? What was the purpose you know, behind that decision? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was working at an agency prior to, to starting Map and Fire and had worked there for about four years. And got the opportunity to to run a team there which was a big part of the reason i took the job at the agency in the first place was i really wanted to build up some of those leadership skills and get a chance to run a team and those kinds of things and got to do those things got to work with some really big name clients got to build a team and you know i think there's sort of a natural point when you when you've worked at a place for at least a few years where you you start to see certain things that you appreciate about what they do but also things that you think you would want to do different if you were running things and i think that happens like the higher up you go the more you start to you know you can either have a real impact at a place or you start to see the limitations of the impact that you can make at a place Absolutely. and i think that's a great driving force to say gosh, I would really like to be able to make the final decision on this. I can't right now. And what would it be like if I could make the final decisions on these things? And, you know, how much better or worse <laughs> might it be? You know, of course, you're sort of thinking like, oh, it'd be so much better. You know, uh, it's, it's never quite that simple. But but that that was really that really was the spark that caused myself and at my at the time the 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 person I kind of co-founded Map and Fire with to 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 jump jump ship and and start working on that. So so the name Map and Fire, I, I've never asked you this, which is <laughs> shocking that I have it. So I'll ask you now. What's the story there? Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> you just went through a whole naming process. I mean, like any naming process it was, you know, coming up with a hundred plus different options and sort of thinking about different things, asking people what they thought of them. Which is and a terrible you, idea. I've which heard. is a terrible idea. It's probably the worst <laughs> thing you can do because it's like, it's like telling somebody what you're going to name your kid. Everybody's got some <laughs> weird association that, that you never thought of that, you know, ruins it in their mind. You're like, why would you ever pick that name? Um, and yeah, so I mean, we we came up with a bunch of different ideas and ultimately, you know, landed on this concept. And I think what's been interesting about the name is it's it's been a name that's sort of grown and evolved in terms of its meaning. I think over time, you know, initially, I the the connection that I always made initially was I felt like map represented the known and fire was for the unknown. Okay. So the map is sort of you know, the things that we can, we can sort of figure out now, but there's always going to be a certain number of things that we can't prepare for. And fire is sort of that representation of, you know, the tool for that. And, and then another interpretation that we've used is that, you know, map is sort of the planning and fire is the doing of, yeah. of business building. So, you know, and we, and if you go to our site, you'll see, we've got a lot of, outdoorsy camping ish type <laughs> uh, feel to the brand. So it's, it's one of the, again, it's one of these brands that had an idea at the beginning and it's just continued to evolve over time. But, but in a weird, you know, you, you've heard the saying, like it, it, there's a commercial that was on recently, like people looking like their dogs or vice versa. Like <laughs> you, you look like your brand. I mean, like you, you, you are like the picture that you have on the website. I mean, you just, it's just so fitting, you know, for, for you when you're st with your style, I don't know what it is, but I think it, it seems like a perfect name. To me. Yeah. I, I, I certainly am a big outdoors guy. I really like camping. I love hiking, love doing lots of different stuff outside. So there's definitely a personal connection from that side of it. And, um, 
yeah, I don't know. It just, I think it also feels, hopefully it feels kind of warm and inviting, you know, a lot of, especially in the agency space, I think a lot of brands present themselves as this kind of cold, refined, perfectly manicured, beautiful imagery kind of vibe. And I think that's great, but I like something that feels more personal, feels more warm and connected because that's how I want us to operate. I want to build real relationships with people and hopefully that some of that feeling comes across. In the yeah, band. it does. Certainly warm and inviting. No question about it. Um, <laughs> which is great, which is, you yeah, know, check. Every, yeah. I mean, I don't know an organization that wouldn't want to be that, right? Not all are. Um, yeah. Needless to yeah. say, I mean, so when, you know, when you started the business, uh, what, was the biggest surprise, you know, from what you thought you'd experience? And I know it wasn't, a, um, I know you've done some entrepreneurial stuff prior to that, but mm -hmm. yeah, what, what, what did you, what, what didn't match your expectations either in a good or bad, bad way? For me there, I know there was a lot, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. We can trade, we can trade some, some stories then, but yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think you never, you never really know. I think going into a new business, exactly what's going to happen. Again, kind of drawing the comparison to having a kid, you're never ready and you right. don't really know what's going to happen. You don't, you don't realize the level of responsibility that you're walking into completely until you do it. But I think, I think, you know, we initially, we, we were a little bit more broad. I would say we were a little bit more of almost like a marketing agency, really. We were doing more website design. We were doing UX design. We were doing a lot of different things. And that just evolved more and more over time to narrow down and really focus more and more on brand strategy specifically. So I think that's that's probably at least one kind of shift, but I don't know. I mean, there's so there's like a million things that, that twists and turns that kind of went along the way. And it it's a mix of the opportunities that come your way and the, the challenges that come your way. And um, yeah, I don't know. What, what about you? What was like, like, did so, you have like a big belief coming in that completely changed? After uh, you? Well, I was naive about a lot of things for sure. Yeah. You know, I, I thought about the, the front end part of it. You know, can I, you know, can I get people um, you know, to trust me to do business with, with, with uh, me? Um, can I get clients? And then can I, you know, since a staffing company, can, can we find candidates, right? Those were, and I thought, well, sure, I, I can find clients. I mean, that's what I do as a professional salesperson, regardless of my, my title and role. That's how I've always thought of myself. And, yeah. but, I, um, so I was confident there for sure, but, and I believed in the business and the way of doing business. I, I just, I had to prove it. It was an itch that had, had to be scratched, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was confident enough in that to, you know, to quit my job and, and, and to take the step. But what I didn't have any, <laughs> I didn't realize was all the other stuff that came with it from insurance to yeah. HR issues, um, that, uh, I just, it, it just never crossed my mind as silly as that seems to me now, because most of my day is spent on back office stuff. A lot, of, <laughs> it seems, um, mm -hmm. which is not what I, what I, wanted necessarily but I, I remember like yesterday the first employee I hired it had been about a month or two and he walked into my office one afternoon and he said what's our uh, vacation policy and I was like uh, <laughs> I guess we need a vacation policy let me let me quick write something down and hand it to you yeah <laughs> yeah I have no idea um so that was it and I and I really missed surprisingly missed having a boss I, I missed having mm -hmm someone that I could turn around and, and have as, you know, check and balance or a final um, you know, decision maker on things. And that was a yeah. weird feeling for years, years. Yeah. And it was lonely almost. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I think yep. the appeal from the outside looking in of being autonomous and owning a business is you know, freedom and flexibility, which is the, the polar opposite of what you get when you start a business. I never worked harder than, yeah, I was working yeah. around the clock and I still feel like I work around the clock at times because I never, you know, when I go to get my hair cut, it doesn't matter. Are you off today? <laughs> <laughs> I never know how to answer that question. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Until my phone yeah. rings and then maybe I'm, you know, uh, I don't sleep tonight. I don't know, but um, it's, yeah, those are things that I think everyone who 
goes out on their own probably has to experience to some degree, right? Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I think it's sort of the the best and hardest thing is both. There's no one to tell you what to do. Also, there's no one to tell you what to do. <laughs> you right. know, it's like fantastic. No one's telling me what to do. I can make all the decisions. Also, there's nobody here guiding any of this except me. <laughs> yeah. So that's yeah. that's hard. But but also, you said something else actually that that now you know, it kind of made me realize this is, this is probably the secret biggest challenge that I didn't think about going in that has become a challenge and obstacle and hopefully turning somewhat into a strength is sales, not realizing how important being essentially a salesperson for the business was going into it and thinking we'll rely on referrals. We'll rely on our network and, that will be enough to kind of bring people into the mix. And it, it is on some level, but at the end of the day, you have to be a salesperson to run a business, I think. And you have to be the one sort of setting the standard of what a sales process looks like, how to best sell it, how to pitch your business to clients. And that was not something that I was had real experience in before. Because you, you have a background as a developer, right? Originally, yeah, my my degree was in computer science. And okay. so I started off as a developer and that's where I worked for multiple years before getting more and more into design and UX and then strategy and, and ultimately brand strategy and research and never along the way. I will say that when I worked at the agency, I sometimes would say that I was an honorary member of the account team because there were a lot of clients a couple key clients, in fact, who would reach out to me first when they had questions about what was going on with their projects or the business or, you know, the strategy or whatever it was at the time. And I really honed, I think, a skill of being that kind of frontline facing account, account-ish type person with them. So that helped, but that's a bit, that's still a, a big difference between being the front line of sales for your business. And so you, know. you weren't, you weren't the developer that just absolutely hated the salespeople because there's a few of those out there. No, I think, I think if anything, I was, I was miscast as a developer because I, as much as I loved develop, you know, the process of development and I love the fact that I was able to create things, which is very appealing to me. I think the, the, and this is a little bit stereotypical, but some of the lack of human connection that you get being a developer, being, you know, a heads down developer working at your desk, I, that wasn't the right fit for me. You know, I'm, I'm a very much an introvert, but have very extrovert tendencies. I love connecting with people on a deep level, having deep conversations, talking with people, but the introvert side of that is, those types of things just take a lot of energy out of me. So I, I love to do it. I just, I know I have to replenish myself afterwards. <laughs> I, I think everyone does probably to a degree. I think some people really um, thrive on being the energy that comes from being around others. Mm-hmm. Where, but I experienced the same thing that you're describing. You know, it, it is exhausting to have to be on mm-hmm. right all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. uh, but it, it's it's also very satisfying too, um, you know, versus being you know, alone, right. Where you don't get any feedback yeah. from anyone else. I think, yeah, I think most people probably fall somewhere in the middle, yeah, you know, whether they realize it or not. And I think the role that people fall into at times can dictate who they think they are in that regard. Um, mm-hmm. but, but maybe not. So it's interesting that you, you went from the, the world of developer to, you know, the most social role you could possibly have, right. I mean, your whole, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, professional life now is about engaging with people. Totally. Yeah, really it is. All of our client engagements are, as you know, they center around these working sessions where we we have a group of people in a room or, you know, virtually in a room where we're talking through ideas, we're pulling ideas out of people, we're keeping conversations going, we're coming up with new ideas on the fly. and, And then also, again, the sales process, you know, it's, it's rare that I have a day that I'm not having multiple 
intense, long kind of conversations with, with people about stuff. And, and again, I love it. I absolutely love that stuff. Um, I just now also recognize by the end of the day, if I have a few meetings like that, I know I'm going to be wiped out and I need time to recharge. Well, do you feel pressured at times to produce creativity, cre creatively at where, you know, you, 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 you're sort of on stage in a way, mm -hmm. right. Where mm -hmm. your client is expecting something in yeah. return, you know, all right, you're, you're the person to produce this creative message or, or whatever it might be. Um, yeah, there has to be some pressure associated with that at times, I would think. Yeah, I think there is at times, you know, and the thing I always say, I think our, our slash my superpower relies on two things. I think one, having a really clear process and structure of how we work through things. And that always gives you a place to come back to. So if, if you're working on something and you know, you're not maybe going the exact direction you think it should be going, or you're unsure about something, you can always come back to the structure of, of how you operate. I think people who sort of believe in this idea of creativity, just being this like purely spontaneous event that, you know, can't be defined and can't be controlled. I think I don't, I don't really buy into that. I think it's something, I think there certainly are creative sparks that happen for sure, but I think the more you can provide some structure and constraints around things, the more creative you become as a result of it. I wonder, so, you think your professional background, you know, education, professional life as a developer mm -hmm. helped you in that regard and having structure because you have to have structure to be a developer, right? I mean, you learn that in school and then you live yeah. that professionally. 100%. I think our whole point of view about how we approach brand strategy is completely informed by my life experience and professional experience. And, you know, again, I always sort of wonder, was I attracted to development originally because of the way I think, or did development sort of shape the way I think <laughs> on some capacity? I think it's, a, it's probably a little bit of both, but, but I've, I've always loved solving complex problems. I've always loved trying to make sense of what might otherwise seem like confusing or, or unusual things. And that goes to everything from human psychology to brand strategy. So the way we operate, the way we do brand strategy is very much dictated by those ideas of like, how can we make sense of this? How can we turn this into a process to follow as opposed to, again, just some creative exercise of, hey, we're going to just come up with ideas for messaging for your brand. That's that's not how we do it. <laughs> Which I imagine you encounter a lot of people who operate that way. I, I'm certainly not one of them. No way. No ifs. <laughs> <laughs> you have to rein in and be like, we can't start at the end. <laughs> right. Start yeah. Um, well, yeah. And I, I mean, everybody does often want to start at the end. Everybody wants to jump to some of the quote unquote fun stuff of, you know, what's, what's our message and what's our website going to look like? And, you know, we have to kind of pull back the reins a little bit and say, we will get there, but let's set the foundation first so we can make really good decisions about those things. Cause we can't just come up with it out of thin air. So did you, you went to school, you know, thinking you were going to be a developer, you know, got your degree in that, not an easy one to get. Um, if, if back then when you graduated, you know, someone said, Hey, I'm from the future and this is what you're going to be doing. Um, ultimately what, how, how would that have, how would you have reacted to that? What if you've, what would have your thought been? That's a, it's a, it's a really, it's an interesting question. I don't know. I think, again, I got into development, I think not because I strictly wanted to be a developer, but because I loved creating things. And when I first discovered programming, which was well before college, what excited me, and I can remember the first time my dad brought a home computer home and I got to play with it. And it wasn't that long be between that arrival and discovering some of the code behind some of the programs that were being used. And the fact that I could change something <laughs> in that program that would impact how the program ran. 
And that was immediately interesting and exciting to me because it meant I could create something and build something that, you know, had value. So, so I guess you were that, kid. Well. that that was, that's, I mean, cause yeah, you know, not many would do that, right. They would want to like, you know, see pictures or, or just, yeah, you know, again, surface level stuff, but you, you took it to a deeper level even, even then. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, thinking back to my childhood, I can remember, taking apart things, (laughs) taking apart a clock, taking apart, you know, just wanting to understand how things worked, not always necessarily putting them back together, but, um, (laughs) but, but yeah, but I think, um, I think going back to your question, would I be surprised at where I've ended up? I think part of me would say yes, because it's certainly not where I started. It was a long winding path to get there. And then part of me wouldn't necessarily be surprised because at the end of the day, what I'm still doing, I think, is helping to create stuff, you know, create ideas to, you know, build businesses, help other people build their businesses. And that still feels, there still feels like a thread that connects those things to me. So sure. I'm sure I would, you know, I think any of us, if we <laughs> if we got visited by ourselves, you know, 20 plus years in the future, we'd be like, what in the hell <laughs> is going? Like, what did you do? How did you get there? But but it's, it doesn't feel so off base. Like if I was an opera singer or something, I'd be like, yeah, like that's crazy. How did, like, I don't know why that happened, but, um, but it doesn't feel, you know, it's like just enough off the course, I guess. No, that makes sense. All right. Uh, so you, you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, young people today want to find meaning in, in the organization they work for the job that they have, um, I think everyone is seeing that and and that's been a growing trend for a while. I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon, but what, um, it, what would you say to young people now who want to get into branding? Cause I think branding is going to be a big piece of that, right? And organizations are going to have to rethink who they mm-hmm. are and how they present themselves potentially. Mm-hmm. So how do you, you know, for, for young folks who, who, you know, have latched on to that and want to want to make that part of their mission. You know, where where do they start? It sounds like it's a niche, right? It's not one you can just you can just fall into. There's not that many jobs available. So, what what kind of advice could you offer there? Well, I guess I would say, to your point, as far as I know, there isn't a brand strategy degree out there at most universities. There's certainly marketing programs, which are a close cousin to to brand work. But the people I know who are in branding have had different paths to get there. I think, again, there's some people who take that creative path to it. They were a designer, they went to art school, they, you know, became a creative director, and then eventually worked on higher level strategy. And then there's people like me, and there's some other people I connected with on LinkedIn who came a bit more on the the technical side of things. And I think that's where branding is going right now is that it's it really is this merging of creativity and data and you know how do we create brands that are smarter, more connected, aligned with customers, all that kind of stuff. So I don't know if I have a great answer to your question other than to say, don't feel pigeonholed by your particular path and think that you couldn't work in brand because there's a lot of different things that come that feed into that type of work. And it could be, you're just a really good writer. You know, it could be you worked in marketing and, you know, now you want to shift over there, but you know, like me, I (laughs) came from a development background and now I'm a brand strategist. So I think as long as you're open and interested in solving really complex problems and you're interested in both business and the creative side of things, I think it could be a great place for you. That's that's how I felt. That's why I've loved it so much is I get to use both sides of my brain. I've always felt like a split personality in that way of, I love the technical, I love solving problems, but I also love the creative and, and those things. And well, that makes sense. Happy, and I think, well, I think you have to have that potential as you do, right? Not everyone has that. So, uh, it, 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 so you just like you, you might want to be an opera singer, if you don't have the voice for it, it's probably not going to work out. So, um, you know, I, but I, it, that's a good answer because I, it's encouraging. And I think it's one that is something that I'm really, uh, 
believing in more and more as time goes on is that you don't, it's not reliant. Success in, in, in most fields doesn't rely on a degree, doesn't rely on a specific background. What it often does rely on is a commitment um, to putting in the time and effort to achieve it, right? That's the hard part always. But um, I think it, we have to acknowledge at some level that the potential has to be there. You know, if, if you want to be a center in the NBA, you can't be five feet tall. You know, no, no it's, just, right. it's, it's just a matter of practicality there. So the propensity to, to, you know, to be good at something, you know, has to be there. And then, and then the hard work <laughs> that needs to come in. Yeah. Yeah. I think if anything, I'm probably, I probably fall a little bit more on the hard work side of things. I think there, like you said, absolutely. There are certain, certain people are gifted with certain things or certain skills. We all have different things that we're really strong at. Um, but I do think like most professions, I think with enough work and effort, you can learn to become skilled and, you know, at a craft and, but you do, like you said, you've got to be willing to put in the time and in some professions are easier to get proficient at than others, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. and, and I will say brand strategy is a weird one. It taps into a lot of different stuff and, you know, but I, but I think the world is going to, the demand for it is going to increase. I, I don't think I got that point out well enough or, you know, a few minutes ago is that yeah. the opportunity uh, companies are going to be you know, looking to dis- you know, be able to um, very much you know, quickly show prospective employees, mm-hmm. clients, this is who we are, not just what we do. And, um, you know, I think, I think you're, you're in a business that's going to, that's going to grow a lot as time goes on. So that's a trend that I see. I think so too. And I think what I've seen is, the conversation around brand is, is, is elevating a lot. And I think the people who are participating in those conversations is increasing. Like you said, I think small and medium-sized business owners, I think once upon a time brand was thought to be the Nikes, the, the Coca-Colas, the giant, you know, those are the companies that have a brand. Yeah, and that's, I think, what I, that's what I thought for sure. And I think the conversation has shifted significantly to where every business recognizes on some level that they have a brand and can work on their brand actively to improve the growth of their business. So, so the fact that it's being more accessible now, I think by, by more people, I agree with you. I think it's hopefully, you know, knock on wood, it's a, it's a growth area. I think you're safe there. Uh, for <laughs> sure. So uh, I think that's a good place to wrap up, except I do have one final question. Sure. Clay, have you found careers in? <laughs> that's a that is a that's a it's such an interesting question uh it sounds so simple on the surface but i feel like there's a lot to unpack potentially i'll try to keep it short and i'll say yes i think so mostly for the the point that i think i've reached finally i think i've reached a point in my career where i have developed enough skill and confidence in what i do that I feel at peace on some level with that. I don't feel like, wow, you know, like I look at other people maybe in my space or other kind of related spaces and think "Ah, they're just in another league. Like I can't ever imagine being there. You know, I feel, I feel closer to that to where I feel a certain level of comfort in, in the state of my career. The only thing I would say is counter to that is I still have so much I want to do, you know, and there's, there's still this really, really driving force that's getting me up every morning and saying, Oh, I want to write about this, or I want to work on this, or I want to do this. And, you know, I don't think those things are mutually exclusive. I think you can have Zen (laughs) careers in and still be very driven um, to do more, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting combination. Well, you know, careers in ish. We'll say, yeah. <laughs> but, but if you, you know, I, I, I hope that's the case because you know, when I think about the future and the life that I hope I have, the life that I would wish for anyone is that it's a life of um, having something to look forward to, right? If mm-hmm. you, if you feel it, 
there's nothing left to accomplish, nothing left to strive for. Like that to me is t- sort of a terrifying thought and, mm-hmm. and depressing thought because mm-hmm. what's the point, right? Like, you know, you want tomorrow to be better than today and, and whatever that means. And so, you know, as I have conversations like this one and ask questions like the one I asked you, I, I of course think have, have I found it as my definition continues to evolve. And I, I, I think having that enthusiasm, it, you know, when you get up in the day if that, that exists, I, I mean, if that's not like career happiness, it, I don't, I don't know what is right. Because if you have everything, then you want nothing. If you want nothing, well, what's the point in getting up at all? Right. And, and so I, you know, that's a very personal, uh, what, what you want, what satisfaction is, what success is. We, we know that's very personal. Um, and, you know, we've had many conversations about that already, but that's something I do hope everyone has the opportunity to find is that thing, you know, that person, that purpose, the, that, um, that is worth getting up for and just like attacking the day. You know, that's to me that that should be Zen. Yeah. I agree. I agree. And if you, if you, if you, if you've lost it or you haven't quite found it, just look a little harder because it's, it's out there. I think for sure, you know, if you've been working a while and you feel like, gosh, I've kind of done all that I want to do. It's like, look a little harder. I bet there's, (laughs) I bet there's more, (laughs) you know, I don't know. At least that's how I feel, but I think you're right. I think that's a good message and, and one to say goodbye on for, for everyone who's been listening because that, um, you know, we, we all, we all, uh, you know, need to keep working to find those things for ourselves. So Clay, thank you so much for, for your time today. I really appreciate it. I like uh, learning more about your history in the business. And, um, from my experience, no question why you're successful, um, because of who you are and the way you do things. So, um, you know, it's been a, an absolute pleasure to speak with you today. Same Pete. Great time. Really appreciate you having me on. Awesome. Well, goodbye for now. Everyone have a good rest of the day and we'll talk to you soon.